Um, thank you again for joining us and for your patience. I would now like to introduce our speaker for today, Bob Sinkovitz. Um, he leads the scientific applications efforts at SGSC and has collaborated with researchers across many fields such as physics, chemistry, astronomy, climate, and social sciences, just to name a few, and has always with an emphasis on making the most efforts, most effective use of high-end computing resources. So please join me in welcoming Bob. Hey, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Um, Cindy, just, just quick check the video and audio is okay? Yes. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. There, there we go. All right, so that thank you everybody for, for joining me for the introduction to parallel computing concepts. This is a talk that I've given a few times. It's, it's a very basic talk where you don't assume any, any background in high performance computing. Um, but we, we felt that this presentation was something that sort of filled in the gap in our, in our training. Um, we have a, um, the, the slides are going to be posted, and we also have a GitHub repo with just a few simple examples in there um, of Python code that I used to generate some of the figures for this presentation, and that you may find useful as you're developing your own allocation requests. Yeah, so an overview of the talk, I'm going to be giving a little bit of an introduction, then I'm going to get into processes, threads, MPI, and OpenMP, and don't be, um, don't be scared by the last two topics. We are not going to be doing any programming. Um, we're assuming that you are essentially non-programmers and users of the supercomputer centers, but these are still topics that you need to be aware of. We'll talk about hybrid applications, which involve you know, mul multiple types of parallelization, Omdahl's law, which is the fundamental law describing the speed up that you can get for a parallel, parallel application. You know, other limits on the scalability, how to run parallel applications and perform a scaling study. And then finally, where to go next for, for some more, more information and some conclusions. And as Cindy mentioned earlier, um, you know, feel free to post your questions into the chat. It's kind of hard for me to follow the questions as we go along. So, you know, Cindy, Susan, feel free to, you know, interrupt me at a, um, you know, at, at a good point if you, if you see fit. So a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of background, a little bit of introduction. You know, what, why are you here? Um, so, and I realized I had, I had modified the, this talk slightly for a um, slightly different audience, but the context is still the same. But ignore, ignore the part where I say machine learning workloads. Um, think of this as any workload. It could be high performance computing, data intensive computing, machine learning. But essentially, the computing that you're doing, the data management and so on, it's grown to the point where you can no longer run them on your local resources. You can no longer, say, use your laptop or your desktop or maybe even your, maybe even your lab cluster. So specifically, you may need to kind of graduate to using large-scale parallel computing. So, you know, as I said, th this was um, a, a more general talk with, little, with a few tweaks for, for machine learning. Okay, so this session is intended for anyone who's currently running, plans to run, or is thinking about running applications on parallel computers. If you write proposals for computer time, so you know, I, I suspect that we might have a few folks in here who are a little more senior who are writing their previously exceed and now allocate or now access allocation requests. So if you're writing a proposal for time, I think these are some concepts that you'll find very helpful. If you're purchasing time on compute resources, you want to maximize the return on your investment. You know, I know a lot of you are going to be computing in the cloud, or maybe you have a workload that spans, say, the nationally allocated resources and, and the cloud. When you're paying real money, you want to make sure that you're maximizing that return on investment. You might be considering purchasing hardware for your lab, or your um, equally good, good, good reason for being here is that you're just curious about parallel computing. You know, what, what it is, what, what can it do for you, what are the limitations? So the motivation for this talk is we looked back at the training um, that, that we do here at SDSC more broadly in Xseed and you know other contexts. Uh, and 
much of the training is, re is really targeted people who write their own parallel applications. And it focuses on a lot on programmer topics. They have things like MPI and OpenMP and CUDA and profiling applications and performance tuning. So as a consequence, those of you who are end users rather than developers, you know, you rarely get a proper introduction to parallel computing. And when I say proper, this is going to be a very, very quick proper introduction, but hopefully it gives you enough of the fundamentals. So even if you don't write code, which is becoming more and more common, it's still important that you understand some of the basic principles of parallel computing so that you can make the most effective use of advanced cyber infrastructure. You know, over the years, I've talk to people either on tours of our data center or you know just casually at parties and they say wow so you have a supercomputer with a with a million cores or a hundred thousand cores or ten thousand cores so you could just put your code on there and you get a you'll get an answer ten thousand times faster i say well there, there are a few caveats there so so we'll talk about them you know you can definitely in, improve your turnaround do large calculations but um you know for, for the most part you're probably not going to be scaling at at that kind of a level. So before, before we you know, kind of dive in more into the technical content, I just want to address a few of the myths of parallel computing. Um, some, some of you are probably aware already that these are myths, but I still find, um, you know, when I talk to researchers from other fields, that they do, that the, these um, misconceptions still do persist. So one of them is that parallel computing is for the astrophysicists and engineers and climate modelers and others who are working in traditionally math intensive fields. And while this might have been partially true decades ago, today nearly every field of research makes use of parallel computing. And this includes the social sciences, life sciences. In fact, on our computers on Expanse and Comet before that, um, it was the life sciences and biomedical research that was really the largest piece of, of our usage. We're even seeing um, so some uptake from, from areas like the arts and the humanities. And of course, this is in addition to all of the usual suspects like physics, chemistry, engineering, material science, and so on. Okay, I kind of touched on this earlier. You know, there's this myth that throwing more hardware at a problem will automatically reduce the time to solution. And parallel computing is only going to help you if you already have an application that has been written to take advantage of parallel ha hardware. And even if you do have a parallel code, there is an inherent limit on scalability. In fact, for a given problem size, if you keep throwing more and more and more hardware at the problem, you may actually get to the point where the code runs slower than running on fewer numbers of cores, GPUs, or nodes. And then there's just one caveat here. Um, that there's something called high throughput computing that they use is parallel computing to run many, many single core or single GPU instances, instances of an application to achieve near perfect scaling. This is what we used to call embarrassingly parallel computing. It's a term that we're trying, trying to get away from because there's nothing wrong with having a workload that consists of many, many small problems that could be run independently. But in this case, if you do have that high, through computing, high throughput computing workload, say where you need to do 10,000, 100,000, maybe even a million, very, very similar small calculations, you can get near perfect scaling. And then finally, and, and this is something that I hope to dispel for, for this group, is that you need to be a programmer or a software developer to make use of parallel computing. A few decades ago, this was kind of partially true, but now most users of parallel computers are not programmers. Instead, you're using mature third-party software that had been developed elsewhere and then made available to the community. So, you know, to say that another way, you know, many, if not most of you, are going to be using somebody else's code. If you're doing climate and weather, you might use um, a code called WARF, you know, very, very widely used for everything from research to, to hurricane tracking. If you're doing if you're doing molecular biology, you'll probably be using codes like, like Amber or Gromax or, or NAMD to, to do the simulations. If you're constructing phylogenetic trees, you might use RaxML or Beast or other, other um, widely used codes. Or if you're doing electronic structure, you might be using CP2K or VASP. So even though you're doing parallel computing, 
you're, you're doing science, you're really not writing your code. So you think, you know, why, um, you know, what, why do I need to know about parallel computing if I'm not actually writing the code? And we're going to get into that into the rest of the presentation. But first, just a little bit of um, overview of, of what parallel computers are. So, you know, if you if you look at the history of computing, for, for a long time we were we were doing serial computing. We had a single process. We we're trying to make it faster, and more powerful. But over the years, we found out that we'd really, really run out of steam. You can only you can only increase the clock speed so much. You can um, only make the instruction buffers so wide. So we had to start going parallel. So our modern clusters and parallel computers they consist of multiple compute nodes connected together by a fast network. Each of the CPU nodes in a modern supercomputer typically contains one or more, most often two multi-core processors. While GPU nodes, kind of the standard now is to get four GPUs in a node. So in order to effectively use this hardware, we need applications when parallelized so they can run on multiple cores, GPUs, both within a node and across nodes. And I'm not going to go into the details of the, of the figure here on the right. This is just a high level view of, of Comet showing how it's built from nodes, which are assembled into racks, and then the racks are networked together into a, into a full supercomputer. And then we have connections to, um, to, to external networks and to storage systems. Bob, yes. I have a question in the chat. Um, it's, it asks, are there studies on how many GPUs per CPU? Oh, you know, that, that, that's a really great question. And if I'm interpreting it correctly, it's a hard answer because there are some applications uh, for example, if you're doing molecular dynamics and you use Amber, where, where the CPU is actually used very, very, very little. Um, and we find that for, for each node that we're running on, even if we're doing multiple, multiple GPUs, that we only need one CPU. Um, you know, sticking in, in the area of molecular dynamics, um, another code, I believe, I can't remember if it was um, Gromax or Games. I believe it, sorry, Gromax or Namdi. I believe it was Gromax. Actually makes much, much heavier use of the CPU because they haven't taken all of the functionality and ported it to the GPUs. Now, in all fairness, um, Amber, um, Amber, Gromax, Namdi, they all work a little bit differently. Amber is typically used for something called um, replica exchange, where you essentially have multiple independent MD simulations going on at the same time with a little bit of, of infrequent exchange data. So yeah, that was a long way of saying that it, it varies. It really, really varies a lot by the, by, by the application. So, and how much of the code had actually been ported to, to run on the GPUs. Good. All right. Excellent. All right. So, so now we're going to start getting into yeah, I'm going to call maybe a little bit of the nerdier topics. We're going to discuss processes, threads, MPI, and OpenMP. So threads and processes are both independent sequences of execution. So a process you could think of as an instance of a program with access to its own memory, to its own state, and file descriptors, so it can open and close files. And then threads are lightweight entities that execute within a process. So every process is going to have at least one thread. You get one thread by default. And threads within a process can access shared memory. And there are advantages and disadvantages both to both the threading and um, to using threads and processes. So if you look online, you know, most of the resources that describe the difference between threads and processes, they tend to be geared toward computer scientists. But I think that the following two from doing my research, I think, do a great job. Um, there's a really nice thread on Stack Overflow that goes pretty deep into what threads and processes are. Um, but you might want to start, if you don't come from a comp sci background, maybe start with the second link, um, which, is, which is more informal and gives you a much higher level um, description of threads versus processors. Okay, so a process. Um, the downside is that they occur more overhead. A process is a full-blown um, instance of the program. 
but they're also more flexible. Multiple processes can be run within a compute node using shared memory, but they could also be um, run across multiple compute nodes, distributed memory. So if you really, really want to scale up to do large scale parallel computing, you need to use processes. Threads incur much less overhead. Threaded codes can also use less memory can, since threads within a process have access to that same data structure. And if you're a programmer, you often find in many cases that it's easier to program for threads than for processes. The problem though is that they're less flexible. Multiple threads within a process can only be run within a compute node, within a single node um, taking advantage of that shared memory. Now there are a few caveats there. Um, in theory, any programming model could be applied to any hardware, but in practice, if you try to run multiple threads across, dis across multiple nodes, distributed memory, um, your performance is going to be terrible, and most applications aren't written to do that. So why do you care about processes and threads? The type of parallelization is going to determine where and how you run your code. So if you have a distributed memory application, you can, um, you know, with multiple processes, again, multiple instances of program, these can be run on one or more nodes. And when I say multiple instances of a program, even when I run an MPI application, which we'll be talking about shortly, you're really having identical copies of that program running, but they'll be communicating through the MPI library and they're all, each process is distinguished by a process ID. Um, shared memory applications can or should be run on, on a single node. And this is also going to affect your, your decision of where to run. Some, some supercomputers will have what we call fatter nodes. There's more memory, more cores per node. So if you have a, shared, a purely shared memory application, you may want to look for a machine that has a lot of cores per node, like Expense or, or Bridges. Um, hybrid applications, this is where it gets a little more complicated. They can be run on more one or more nodes. But you should consider the balance between threads and processes. This is where it gets a little, little more complicated. And in all cases, you may need to consider how processes and threads are mapped and bound to cores. And I won't be getting into those, into those details here today, but we have some documentation on the Expanse webpage and our um, user services staff, user support staff, um, you know, really understands this very deeply, how to make sure that, say, individual threads remain bound to cores. So in addition to being aware of threads and processes, you know, this is going to help you understand your code, how it's utilized in the hardware, and identifying common, common problems. So we're going to talk very, very briefly about message pass and interface, or MPI. We're not going to get into programming this. This is not a programming talk, but you do need to be aware of it. So MPI is you know, what we call the de facto standard for paralyzing C, C++, and Fortran codes to run on distributed memory, multiple compute node systems. So as I said, while it's not officially adopted by any of the major standard bodies, it is so widely used that it's really the de facto standard. Now, where it gets a little confusing is you may hear um, about things like OpenMPI and MVAPPITCH and MPITCH, and even vend there are vendor supported versions like Intel MPI. These are just implementations of, of MPI. They should all have the same functionality. In some cases, you may want to build your code with one version or another for, 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 for performance reasons, but they should all work for your application. MPI applications can be run within a single shared memory node. So all widely used MPI implementations take advantage of that faster intranode communications. MPI is portable and you can use it anywhere. You could use it on any supercomputer, any cluster. And then finally, although I said it's a de facto standard, it's become kind of synonymous with distributed memory parallelization, there are other options out there, something like called something called Charm++, which is used in the NAMD molecular dynamics package. And in fact, our previous director at SDSC is using Charm++ to um, parallelize his state-of-the-art um, cosmology code, something called UPC, um, Universal, I believe it's Universal Parallel C, um, X10. So there's a few things, a few other things out there you might want to keep an eye on. Okay, so although we're discussing MPI, 
The same principles are going to apply when parallelizing deep learning applications. So if you're coming from a um, machine learning or AI background, there are things out there like Horovod. This is a distributed deep learning um, framework for TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, and Apache MXNet. There's also something called Nickel. This is the NVIDIA Communicate Collective Communication Library, which is used for multi-GPU and multi-multi-node uh, communications. Again, these are things that you are probably not going to be directly programming with, but you should be aware that there are these um, the, the, these distributed memory approaches for for machine learning codes. So. I'm just going to emphasize one more time that this is not a programming talk. Um, if you are not a programmer or an application developer, you do not need to know MPI, but I think everybody should be aware of what it is. MPI applications could be pretty dense. It's written at a low level. If you were a C programmer, um, it, it will probably make sense. If you're not a programmer, if you've only programmed in higher level languages, it may look what we call a little too close to the metal. Data is explicitly communicated between processes using calls to MPI library routines. So again, if you're not a programmer at all, you could kind of zone out for the next minute. Um, but if you are a programmer, you may have seen a code that looks something like this. This is the first code that you will write as a C or a C++ programmer, just the hello world. We um, include a header. So we could um, get, get the IO routines, IO functions. We declare a main function, and then we have one executable statement, printf. Now, what the MPI application is going to look like, and all of the MPI stuff is highlighted in bold and purple, is you need to add a header. You need to um, initialize the MPI environment. You need to get the number of processes, the rank of each process get a name associated with each process. And now here I've modified the print statement to say, to, to, speak, to, to write out hello world from each process. So what we've done now is we've created identical copies of this program that are gonna be running. And at this point, the only thing that distinguishes them is their, is their rank. So again, if you're not a programmer, you don't need to know how to write MPI, but I just wanted to show you what it looks like. Okay, OpenMP, switching gears a little bit, is an API for shared memory programming and used in C, C++, and Fortran. It provides a collection of compiler directives, library routines, and environment variables. It's supported by all the major compilers. Um, in fact, of all the compilers I've worked with, I've never seen a modern compiler that does not support OpenMP. So if your code's been paralyzed using OpenMP, you should be able to build it and run it anywhere. And I know for sure that it's supported by IBM, Intel, GCC, um, PGI, um, AMD Optimizing Compiler Collection, which is what we use on Expanse. So again, it's portable and you can use it anywhere. And like MPI, it's often synonymous with shared memory parallelization, but there are a lot of other options out there. There's the Silk programming language, which looks a lot like C with a few extensions. There, there's POSIX threads, which is a little bit lower level. And there are specialized libraries for Python, R, and other programming languages. So same caveats apply here to the, to the MPI example. If you're not a programmer or an application developer, you do not need to know OpenMP. But if you are, you know, just pay attention for a minute. This is a simple bit of C code that initializes two arrays, A and B. So, so the first loop here initializes, um, initializes those arrays. And then the second loop will add them element by element and then store them in a third array, C. So if I want to um, parallelize that code, you know, I have a little bit of um, header information up here in the beginning. The main, main thing is that I've added what we call a pragma to the code. And we're not going to get into the syntax, but essentially this says, I want to take all those iterations of that next loop, and I'm going to break them up across thread. And each of those threads is going to get a chunk of work. In this case, my chunk size is 100. It's going to finish its portion and portion of the work. And then it's going to sit there and wait and say, okay, I'm ready. I want some more, more, I want some more iterations to work on. So again, it's, 
OpenMP code tends to be a little bit more readable. Um, if you're doing very basic things, easier to write. And all you need to be aware of if you're building your code is that you use the appropriate compiler flags. And unfortunately, this is not standard across compilers, depending on which, which compiler you're using, Intel, um, AOCC, or others. You know, you might find that it's dash F OpenMP, dash Q OpenMP, dash MP, um, and others. And this is all documented in the Expanse User Guide. I know I'm being a little Expanse-centric, but if you are using um, any of the other major previously exceed and now access allocated resources, if you go to, the, your, to their user guides, they will all give you a um, description of the compiler flags that you need to use in order to, to build your code. Bob, we have a question in the chat. Yes. Um, could me... you, oh. Yeah, I'll go ahead and um, I could read it. Okay. Um... Actually, no, it's directly to me, so I have to read it to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, could you give an example on when we should choose OpenMP over MPI and vice versa? Oh, that's um, that that's kind of tough. And like my previous answer, it's going to depend on the on the application. So I would say, um, if you well, if you're an end user and you're not writing your own applications, you're kind of stuck with with with, with the software that's available. But more generally, I would say, if you have an application that's going to need to run across a large number of cores or nodes, you know, you need to you need to run on a thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand cores. You have no choice but to go with Open M Sorry, to go with MPI. If we go with OpenMP, you're going to be limited just to running within a single node. Now, sometimes that's not so bad. These nodes now have so much memory, 256 gigabytes, um, 100, you know, in our case, 128 cores, that you can do a lot of computing on there. So basically, MPI, if you want to go really big, um, if you're staying within a node, you'll probably be more efficient using, using OpenMP since threads are lighter weight. But in the next couple of slides, though, I'm going to talk about hybrid code. And this is where it gets a little more complicated, and then I'll answer your, I, I think, be answering your question a little more thoroughly. And if you just want to give um, Cindy um, a, a thumbs up that that answered the question. Okay, good, I see that. Okay, and there's one other question. Can shared memory programs cause memory corruption? Ooh, shared memory programs? They, even though they're easier to write, they're, um, they, they can get you into trouble. Um, you, you need to be a little more careful that, that threads aren't writing into each other's memory. Um, so I'm going to say you, 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 have to, you have, really have to be aware of, of what's going on in your code. Again, if you're an end user of a well-written code, if you're using the, the VASPs and Gromax and Ambers and NAMDs and WARFs and you know, other codes, this is probably, this is probably not gonna be a problem, but yes, it can cause, it, it can cause met memory, met memory corruption if it's not written properly. Whereas MPI codes, since you're working with multiple processes, that those processes are more isolated and they just kind of work in their, in their own sandbox. And Rebea, did that um, answer your question? Excellent, thank you. And and feel free to follow up with me with me later if you like. Um, okay, so MPI and OpenMP, the big picture. On the left, we talk about MPI. On the right, we talk about OpenMP. MPI um, is used when you when you're managing multiple processes. And then MPI is implemented in the libraries in this MPitch and OpenMPI and vendor implementations and MVAPitch. Threads are managed using OpenMP and OpenMP is implemented by compilers. Okay, so now we're gonna get into hybrid applications. And this is gonna get a little more into answering the, the, the previous question about when should I use threads slash OpenMP? When should I use processes slash, um, slash MPI? So a lot of modern applications are built using a hybrid approach to take advantage of both distributed and shared memory. 
And this will typically involve, especially for HPC applications, um, MPI and OpenMP, although, as I mentioned earlier, there are some other combinations possible. So hybrid codes have advantage over the purely shared or distributed memory apps in, in a couple of ways. So shared memory apps, as I just said, they have limited scalability. You pretty much need to run within that node rather than across multiple nodes. Now distributed memory applications, they may have higher memory, memory requirements. I'll okay, give an example of that in a few more slides. And they also introduce some more overhead. So what you're going to need to do, and this is where it gets a little complicated, you may need to think about the balance between threads and processes to get, to get the best performance. So I'm going to go to a very, very simplified view of a parallel computer. Um, you'll never see anything this small or this simple. But let's say that we have a, we build a really simple parallel computer. It consists of two nodes. Each of them have 16 cores, and we have some kind of interconnect or network joining them. So that could be Ethernet or, um, or, or InfiniBand. So the big box, the, the two big boxes are, are nodes, and I've indicated the cores as the small blue boxes. So if we have a purely message passing application, so let's say we have an application parallelized using just message passing. We want, we want to run across, we want to use all 32 of those cores. The only way to do it is to run one process per core. So basically we have a process associated with each of those cores. If we have a threaded application, now we're going to be restricted to a, to a single node. And in this case, let's say we wanted to use all um, all, all 16 of those cores. In this case, we would be running a single process, and within that process, we're going to have 16 threads. Um, so one thread for each core. And I've alluded to this earlier. Technically, any programming model can be mapped to any hardware, but in practice, you really need to run threaded applications within a single node. Now, hybrid applications is where things get a little more interesting. So if we have a code that was, say, parallelized using MPI and OpenMP, we can use any combination of threads and processes such that they, um, such that they you know, add up to the, to the number of cores we want to use. So in this case, I'm running two processes per node and eight processes, sorry, and eight threads per, per process. A typical scenario I'm going to say more typical before the number of cores in a node really started growing was to use threads within a node and then, sorry, sorry, run one process per node and then use threads within the node. But this is becoming a little less common as these nodes are getting really fat. You know, currently we have um, two 64 core processors for a whole total of 128 cores within Expanse. Um, I believe that if you follow the AMD roadmap, there's probably going to be processors coming out, you know, in the next few years that might have 96 cores. So these, node, the, these nodes are getting really, really fat. But this was kind of the typical way that these hybrid applications were run. One process per node and then threads within the, within the process. But here's where it gets more complicated, or I'm going to say complicated-er. You could do anything in between. So on the left-hand side, I'm doing one process per node and then a number of threads equal to the number of cores all the way to the other extreme where I'm running, when I'm running one process per core. And you could do anything in between. So in this case, um, the question is, you know, how many cores, how many processes should I use? I'm going to say it's complicated. And the only way that you can really figure this out is going to be it's going to be highly, highly application and possibly problem dependent. Is that you just need to benchmark it. You'll need to, you'll just need to run a small problem using um, using different configurations. And again, here I'm not. I don't have time to go into the details. But if you look at the Expanse user guide and the user guides at the other major supercomputer centers, they'll explain how you can um, how you can run the hybrid applications. Okay, so now we're going to get into Amdahl's law. We're going to talk a little bit about the limits on scalability. <coughs> so 
Amdahl's law describes the absolute limit on the speed up of a code as a function of how much of that code can be paralyzed and the number of processors. So if you know just one law of parallel computing, this is the one to know. This is, um, you know, th 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 this, this, is, this is the law. I had a, you know, a graphic in one of my earlier presentations where it was Charlton Heston coming down with the coming down with the Ten Commandments, and I had pasted um, Amdahl's law onto the uh, onto the tablet. So, yeah, if if you're if you need one one fundamental thing that you know, it's Amdahl's law. So let's say that P is the fraction of the code that can be parallelized, and S is the fraction of the code that must be run sequentially. So together, the serial fraction plus parallel fraction is going to equal one and n is the number of processors, the absolute best speed up that you can get from your code is as a function of the number of processors is given by, by this formula, one over one minus p plus p over n. So you can see one minus p represents the, um, re represents the um, serial fraction of the code and p over n represents the parallel fraction divided by the number of processors. So this is assuming that as we keep doubling the number of number of processors that we have, um, that, that we're having the runtime, cutting the runtime in half for all of the um, parallel content. So in the limit where we let n go to infinity, where we run on an infinitely big supercomputer, the limit on our speed up is going to be one over s. So one over the serial content. So you might be looking at this to say, hey, that doesn't seem so bad, but I'm gonna show you in the next slide that it doesn't take much serial content to quickly impact the speed up. So what I'm showing here is um, you know, the, the Amdahl's law equation plotted as a function of number of cores on, on the x-axis and speed up on the, on the y-axis. And I'm showing this for parallel content of 50, 75, 90, and 95%. So if we have parallel content of 50%, you know, and by parallel content, I don't mean the number of lines of code, but the amount of time spent in the code. So if we could take that parallel content, divide it across many, many, many processes until it vanishes, until the time spent in parallel content vanishes, we're left with that little bit of serial content, and that's going to drive, determine what our maximum speed up is. So you can see with, um, 50% parallel content, the best we're going to do is a 2x, 75% a 4x, 90% 10x, and 95% a 20x. And even if we go out to code with 99% parallel content, the very, very best speed up we're going to get is, is 100x. And I should add that the situation is even a little more dire than I make it seem here, because you're not going to keep throwing more and more um, hardware at the problem to get incrementally, um, incrementally better, better performance. So I'm shown here on this top curve with the arrow. This is the 99% parallel content or 1% serial content that even if we have a code with 99% parallel, parallelizable content, you still wouldn't want to use all of the cores on one node of expense. In this case, if we we're using all 128 cores, you'd see that we, we're only getting a speed up of 60x. So we're really wasting a lot of hardware. So at this point, you might be getting a little depressed um, about what parallel computing can do for you, but I'll talk a little bit later how, um, how, how, how the situation isn't as bad as it looks. But first, I'm gonna talk about some other limits in scalability. So, as I emphasized a few times, Amdahl's law sets an absolute theoretical upper limit and speed up, but there are other factors. So there's communications overhead. It takes some time to move data be between processes or move it across the network between nodes. There's going to be um, issues with problem size. If you have a small enough problem, you can only cut it up into so many pieces. And then there's going to be uneven load balancing. So in these real life applications that involve communications and synchronization, you know, where the threads and the processes have to all complete their share of the work before, before proceeding, or if we have irregular problems, non-Cartesian grids and so on, the speed up can be much less than predicted by Amdahl's law.
And I see a question in the chat. This would actually be a good time to answer it. Okay, so yeah, great, great question from, and I hope I'm getting the name right, Rebea. Um, this may be a weird question, but how do you determine what part of your code is paralyzable? Um, I can think of some examples like sensor data reading can be paralyzed from processing, but is there a rule of thumb? And this is really, really hard. Um, Amdahl's law is, it, it's, it's very theoretical. Um, you know, it, it, you're going into it assuming that you know what the parallel content is or what the serial content is, but it's really, really hard to, to measure that directly. So what I'm going to say, and I'll be getting to this into the next few slides, is what it really comes down to is you have to do some benchmarking studies. And from that, you're going to start getting a feel for how much is parallelizable and how many cores you should be running on. But yeah, a fantastic question. If you had a very, very, very simple code that just did a couple of things, you could, you, you might be able to um, figure it out. But for real applications, it's almost impossible to just look at the code and determine that. All right, so I'm going to you know, talk about just a few of the things that impact your parallel scalability. First of all, parallelizing the code requires that you divide the computational work into chunks that can be executed independently. And if the work cannot be distributed evenly, then processors are going to sit idle waiting for the longest chunk to finish. So here's a case where we're running on, you know, on four cores or four CPUs, or it could also be GPUs, where the initial chunk of work is largest for CPU, um, what well, largest for CP, CPU two, and a little bit shorter for zero, one, and three. So what's going to happen is zero, one, and three are going to complete their work. And if we have that synchronization point that indicate with the arrow and the vertical line, they just have to sit there idle waiting for waiting for CPU two to finish. And then in the in the next chunk of work, CPU one was given the given the most work, and the other processes or threads need to need to sit idle. We also have communications overhead. Um, if you're doing computational fluid dynamics, magnetohydrodynamics, climate, weather, anything involving systems of partial differential equations, you're probably going to be doing a simulation on a, on a discrete grid. So let's say, and this is an unrealistically small problem, but let's say we have a 16 by 16 grid. We divide that into four, into four eight by eight chunks, and we distribute that across our four processes. And let's assume that the value of each cell depends on the value of the neighboring cells. We might have, um, you know, we, we might have um, you know, material flowing across across those cell boundaries, or we need to you know, make updates for, for diffusion or temperature gradients or so on. So for cells that are within the interior of each chunk, calculations can be done within each process. But for cells at the boundaries, we need data from the neighboring processors. So now we have to add ghost cells around, the, around those chunks. So that adds a little bit of overhead. It requires more memory, um, yeah, more, more, more storage. So, oh, sorry, let me go back. Um, and, and that's going to, to impact your um, scalability. All right, so I hope I didn't scare everybody off thinking that Whoa, there's so many things that can go wrong with parallel computing and limit my, li limit my scalability. So between the hard limits imposed by Amdahl's law and all of the other factors that affect scalability, how does anyone ever use all the cores on a single modern compute node, let alone the full power of large supercomputers? So first of all, and I, I forgot to put this bullet on here, often the real computations that you have to do we involve very, very, depending on the nature of them, very, very little serial content. So the um, parallel content could, could be much higher. It could be 99.9, 99.99, and so on percent. But first of all, the reality is that most parallel applications do not scale to thousands or even hundreds of cores. You could do a lot of great parallel computing within a single within a single node, and we see this in certain fields like phylogenetic, constructing phylogenetic trees, and a lot of computational chemistry. Now, the applications that achieve high scalability, they employ several strategies. Again, as end users rather than programmers, you don't need to worry so much about how this is done in practice. But first of all, we often grow the problem size 
with the number of cores or nodes. This is something um, called, called Gustafson's law. So instead of, you know, say working with a 16 by 16 grid and dividing it across four or eight or 16 or 32 or so on processes, instead we're gonna solve a much, much larger problem so that each of those threads or processes is gonna have a lot more work to do. We can also overlap communications with computation. So while we're waiting for data to be exchanged, we could actually be doing computing in the background. We could do dynamic load balancing to assign work to cores as they become idle. In fact, I did this in an application of my own in computational economics a few years ago, where we were analyzing um, the activity of entire stock exchanges and the dynamic range for, for analyzing each stock, which could be done independently, range from minutes to less than a second. But by dynamically assigning the work, starting with the biggest chunks, distributing them, and then as processes become, become free, assigning them pieces of work, we're able to get near perfect scalability. And you can also increase the ratio of the computation to communication. If you're doing more work, um, a perfect example is reactive flow. So studying combustion, you know, this is an extension of computational flow dynamics. All of that work that you're doing, solving the chemistry, is gonna overwhelm a lot of the, a lot of the other computations and communications. So now you've increased that ratio of computation to communication and your scalability is gonna look a lot better. So we've got about 10 minutes left and I think I'm gonna get into the, the most practical um, topic in this talk. And that is, you know, running the parallel applications. We've covered the basics of parallel computing, hardware, threads, processes, Amdahl's law and scalability. So you got a lot of theory, a lot of background, but this kind of, but what we ultimately wanna know as end users of supercomputers is, all right, how many CPUs or how many GPUs should I use when I'm running my parallel application? And the only definitive way to answer this is to perform a scaling study using a representative problem run on different number of processors or, or GPUs. And by a representative problem, I mean one with the same size, the grid dimensions, number of particles, number of images, number of genomes, and complexity, the level of theory, the type of analysis, all of the physics that you include, as the research problem that you want to solve. So this doesn't mean that you need to solve your entire research problem. If you're doing something like molecular dynamics, and let's say you need to run for, you know, for, for a million time steps, you could benchmark that using a using thousand or 10,000 time steps. If you're doing um, computational fluid dynamics, you don't need to keep going out um, you know, for, for a large number of steps, just enough that you're getting something that's representative of the problem and that you're not being overwhelmed, say, by the startup time, say, reading and, re reading and writing data. So th this is probably gonna be the most important thing to, to know if you're writing um, re requests for, for time on the supercomputers, or even if you wanna make good use of your own resources. So what I'm showing here are scaling plots, um, run, run time on the y-axis, number of cores on the x-axis, for two different codes. And w without reading ahead, now see if you can look at these and decide which one has better scaling behavior. And I'm gonna say, it's kinda hard to tell since the timings at large core counts are indistinguishable. So what I've done here is I've plotted the runtime as a function of number of cores on linear axes. And this is a terrible thing to do because I cannot, I really can't tell how much of a speed up I got going say from 64 cores to 128 cores. And these two codes, they look indistinguishable to me. So the right way to present scaling results is to use log axes. So I have um, log logarithmic for the time, logarithmic for the, for the number of cores. Doesn't matter if you use log two, log 10. It, it's pretty common to, to use log two for, for the number of cores, but as long as you know, it's, it's, a, it's a log axis. So now I'm showing the exact same data from the previous slide 
that's with linear axes, that that's with log axes, and you can see that the situation is completely different. So, um, you know, the, the red line is showing the showing the runtime as the function of the number of cores. I've added in a, a little guideline here to show you what 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 linear um, scaling should look like. And also, I think it's very handy to show the, um, the the parallel efficiency. So basically, this is the speed up divided by the number of cores. So if you have an efficiency of one, that means every time you double the number of cores, you cut the runtime in half. Um, on the left hand side, we can see that we're doing pretty well in the beginning. Um, you know, drops off a little bit. You know, at the smaller core counts, and then it kind of plunges. So this gives us a lot more insight, and this is what the reviewers will want to see when you submit an allocation request. So now the question is, where should I be on that scaling curve? Um, should I you know, run at a very high parallel efficiency, but it's going to take my code longer to run? Or should I go to lower parallel efficiency, which will be much faster, but will be wasting resources? So I'm going to say if your work is not particularly sensitive to the time to complete a single run, consider using CPU or GPU counts that give you something at or very close 100% efficiency, sometimes even if that means running a single core. Um, this isn't always practical. There may be some calculations that just take too long or require too much memory. But if you could, try to be, um, you know, try, try to stay at a high um, parallel efficiency. This especially makes sense for parameter sweep workloads, where you're doing the same calculation with many times through different sets of inputs. OK, you can go out a little bit further on the scaling curve if the job would take an unreasonably long time to complete at the lower at the lower core counts, or if shorter time to solution helps you make progress in your research. Like let's say you're doing a molecular dynamics simulation, and yet you really don't want to wait all week for that to complete. You might want something that can complete in an afternoon or a day. It's going to make you more scientific. It's going to make you more um, productive as as a researcher. Um, if your code does not have checkpoint restart capabilities and the runtime would exceed the queue limits, you'll have no choice but run at higher core counts. I see we've got a question here. Oh, so from Zhao Fei, how to calculate the parallel efficiency. Um, parallel efficiency is just the um, it is just the speed up divided by the number of cores. So for example, if I got a um, 16x speed up on 16 cores, my parallel efficiency would be one. If I had a um, if I had a um, 8x speed up on 16 cores, my efficiency would be um, would be 50%. And also in the um, in the accompanying um, GitHub repo, I have an example where I calculate the parallel efficiency. And again, feel free to um, feel free to follow up with me later if you have any more questions. All right, we're almost done. Um, and and when when can I run further out on the scaling curve? So let's say um, time to solution is really, really critical. Then it's OK to run at lower efficiency, but be sure to justify this in any allocation requests. So let's say that you need to do calculations that are run on a regular schedule. Say data is collected during the day, and you need to process it overnight. Um, a perfect example of this is the um, atmospheric river simulations that are done at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. They want to they wanna be able to have that prediction the next, um, the next morning. Um, sometimes, you know, and we don't use our, our supercomputers for anything quite so critical, but if you're in a, um, if you work in an operational environment, you know, where you're tracking tornadoes or tsunamis or hurricanes, you can run way down here, you know, much smaller, you know, much worse parallel efficiency. If getting that answer really, really, really quickly is important. So for example, I'd much rather that somebody you know wasted some computer time to give me a heads up that a tornado tornado is coming um you know not knowing say five minutes in advance rather than one minute in advance yeah you know, kind of an extreme case but most of you are going to be further out here better parallel efficiency um one other consideration and i'll just talk about this very very quickly sometimes if you have a 
application with a very, very large memory footprint, you'll need to get, you'll need to request more cores just to get the, just to get the memory. Normally you will get um, number of cores proportional to the proportional memory. So let's see on, on, on expanse, you get just under, do it right, you get just under two gigabytes per core. But if you have something with a really, really big memory footprint that doesn't special, that doesn't scale well, it's okay. Just make sure that you justify it. And then finally, when we got about two minutes left, you know, where to go next? We only scratched the surface. And I, sorry, I realized that this slide is still exceed centric. You know, the new access program is still getting up to speed. But I believe that the exceed web pages are still available. Um, you know, XSEED and SCSC, they have many training resources covering a wide range of topics. And then for, um, you know, for, for the nationally allocated resources, they have user guides that, um, you know, that have a lot of practical information on job submission, accounting, compilation, data movement, available software, and other site-specific content. And I promise to get this updated once, um, access is a little bit more up and up and running. So just a few, few conclusions, absolute last slide, parallel computing is for everyone who wants to accomplish more research or solve more challenging problems. You don't need to be a programmer, said this many times already, but you do need to know some of the fundamentals in order to effectively use a parallel computer. Processes are instances of programs, threads run within a process and access shared data, MPI and OpenMP, are just um, you know li libraries, compiler directives, and so on. Use the parallel codes. Amdahl's law gives you that upper limit of scalability, but be aware of the other factors. And then finally, when you are requesting time through access, be sure that you know how to display your scaling data and choose your chord counts. Um, and I have some code here that I used to generate the figures in this presentation. And in fact, I would even recommend if you were writing an allocation request, just go there, use my Jupyter notebooks and plug in your own data. And if you want to give me any feedback on them, I'd, I'd be happy to um, accommodate pull requests. And I see one more question. Okay, Cindy just posted that. And with that, I am all done. So I'm happy to take any questions. I know we're at the top of the hour, but I can stick around for just a few minutes for those of you who are interested.